Welcome in to the Just Basketball Show for Monday, August 28th. I'm Chris Manning. That is Brendan Clean. We have Dylan Heiser, as always, on production. Remember to hit subscribe on the Just Basketball Fans YouTube channel if you haven't already. Follow us on your podcast app of choice. Five-star reviews only. And wanted to remind you about our friends at Homage. Homage is an ultra-comfortable specialty apparel company with NBA and WNBA licenses that uses vintage-inspired designs to pay homage to the greatest stories, traditions, and figures across sports, music, and pop culture. Right now, I'm wearing a Homage Cleveland football hoodie. It is super cozy. It is super comfortable. I've just been lounging around on this Sunday before we recorded, hanging up some things in my apartment, just being cozy, and there's nothing I'd rather do that in than any of my Homage stuff, but I particularly love their hoodies use the link below and make your purchase and some of your money from your purchase will come back to you support the just basketball show big big fan of homage support them they support us all right we have a jam-packed show today later this week we are going to look ahead to the stretch run of the WNBA season uh, we have one more aces liberty game coming up on the docket we're going to talk about I that we had no idea there was another one is that embarrassing I, to admit i i just forgot i thought the couple weeks ago when they played twice in that one week yeah. i was like okay and then we'll see him in the finals but I, I i looked up on espn and i was like cool round 15 or whatever this is i'm down let's watch it so so what i do every week brendan to prep myself for all the sports that i want to watch or like things i want to do is i'm big on taking my google calendar and blocking off time and then i kind of like see and i like certain teams like the guardians or tottenham or the Cavs. that's a team i primarily cover in person i have like all their games like just i sync the calendars what I do for like WNBA or other NBA games or the stuff is I like pick the games I make sure I want to watch and then I add them and like so I had started to do that for the stretch of the WNBA season to get ahead of it last night uh, when I got home because I just am a loser on a Saturday night at like 1130 like organizing my life that's just what I my brain is just ruined I guess and that was when I was like oh cool so I also had nice little, not realized nice little this Monday evening treat yes yeah much better than the uh 6 a.m. treats we've been getting with this World Cup. Which we'll talk about later, but later in the week, uh, we will do some FIBA stuff, uh, or excuse me, WNBA stuff, but today we're going to talk about FIBA in detail, but we're, and we're going to talk about th- these Giannis quotes to the New York Times. Funny what happens when the New York Times has a sports section. What a concept, the paper of record having a sports section. But uh, we're going to start with P.J. Washington, Brendan, who finally got a contract. Three years, $48 million, first reported by Woj via his agents telling Woj or that he got this contract. Uh, Brendan, here's my thoughts on this. I think this is a win for both sides. I think this is fair for him because he can hit for agency again at 28. And at $16 million a year, this is a super tradable contract if a team comes calling for a first, if Charlotte wants to get more young assets and whatever they want to do because I think he's a guy that can scale up on a much on teams that are going to be better than Charlotte the next couple of years. I, I think this is probably like he got squeezed a little bit on the market, but it's only three years. He's still getting sixteen million. I think this works out for everyone here. Totally fair deal. Much closer to I believe it was twenty was kind of the sticking point that had been out there as they were negotiating. I think getting sixteen is a pretty big win for him, honestly, because if you hear like 20 is a no-go from the team side, my brain goes to like, you know, they're they're looking more at like mid-level money, just above. You look at some of the contracts that guys got. I mean, what was Grant Williams' deal? It it was around this, right? So I think- Who would you rather have, Grant Williams or PJ Washington? I would rather have Grant, I think, because uh, one, it's just more of a proven commodity, less of an injury risk. But two, I think even though Grant is an inconsistent three-point shooter, I think that part of his game you probably feel a little better about, whereas it's never really been a huge part of what P.J. Washington does. He's not somebody who's going to jack up 10 of those. But what was the what was the Grant contract? It looked like you were so, pulling it up. Yeah, so you, you knew you knew where I was going. So Grant got less than this. He got four years, 53, 12.4 yeah. next year, 13 the next year, 13.6 the year after that, and then the last year in 26-27 uh, is 14.2. Grant Williams right now is 24, so he'll also be around 28 years old, give or take birthdays, when he'll hit for A&T again. So they're both yeah. hitting for A&T about the same age, but... PJ gets there sooner, and PJ is getting more money over the next three. Is going to just get more money over these next three years than, than Grant is. 
Yeah, and I think part of that obviously is just the, you know, staying with your actual team and having that team have no real better way to spend their money, I guess. PJ is a little taller. I got to admit, in my head, PJ Washington is a lot taller than 6'7. But that he plays some set is because because he does some say because he does some like play some real small ball five stuff that's like part of the well, yeah no I, yeah. for sure but it's funny to compare him to Grant because like Grant was somebody coming out of Tennessee we thought could play some small ball center because he did that at Tennessee and then once he got to the NBA I was like okay probably not but then for some reason I think we all kind of assume PJ Washington still has that potential and it's like really just one inch one inch can do it for you or you're a potential small ball center, but Grant Williams at six, six just isn't, I mean, I don't and know. Grant, I, I think Grant's maybe... got the, Grant's got the muscle advantage. I like, I think like Grant's definitely yeah. like a little bulkier. So, so it's just funny that we still think PJ Washington is maybe that guy and we should maybe think of him as, as not that guy. And I want to, I, I guess I, I should probably uh, peel back a little bit. He did take a career high six threes a game this past season, but didn't make them. Um, so they are pretty similar players, but I think this is a fair contract just because the Hornets need to retain their talent. They don't know what's going to happen with Miles Bridges. And P.J. Washington's a very good player who can play in the playoffs, whether that's whenever the Hornets finally get there or on another team that trades for him, like you mentioned uh, when you were introing. Yeah, so when the market for him, too, I think just led him back to this because like there were teams inter- like reported having interest, but no one really has cap space anymore, for one. And like sign and trade stuff is really tricky. Cleveland, for instance, was like a team like there's been Chris Fudo, Cleveland.com has reported that they liked him. But it's like, why would Charlotte take like second round picks and like Isaac Accor and Ricky Rubio or Dean Wade's contracts? Just like what? Like, A, I don't think like Cleveland giving up three bodies for one like sub all star player makes a ton of sense. And secondly, like, I don't, why did Charlotte do that? Charlotte should be taking him on a guaranteed contract and saying, okay, we either keep him or like in a year we flip him. For a first for a team that's in in win now mode, um, but I want to talk a little bit about more about Charlotte here for a second before we move on to some of the last bits of free agency stuff, Brendan, because there are still some guys out there, and we have a little game we're gonna play. Not really a game, just like name some dudes, which is just like a, a classic dude thing to do. But I I think Charlotte is just like he PJ Washington feels like a piece that's a little bit like ready to to scale up. And, like, this Hornet team just, like, isn't. So that's the part about this that is um, a little bit tricky to me. I'm curious to see where they go. And I still feel like I feel like this team is going to still – like, I don't think this is the year they figure out what this is. I don't think we know what this organization, this new ownership group that's replacing Michael Jordan is really all about yet. I don't think we have any inclination of that. I don't think Steve Clifford's like going to be the coach that like probably unlocks all of the talent they have. Like we're going to talk about him later. I don't think he's going to be the coach period for the team. No. Right. But it's like Jordy, like Jordy Fernandez to me seems like someone who I'd like much rather have like molding this right now than I would Steve Clifford as unfair to Steve Clifford. Is it? It's like this is just still just one of the weirdest setups to me in the league as we're looking ahead to next year. A little yeah, bit. but that's natural, right? I mean, I think everybody that has a job here is going to be gone by this time in 2024, and that's not even uh, because they're bad. It's because one, they're on no the ownership. older side, and two, they are going to be replaced by people who this new ownership group feels better about. I mean, obviously, one of these owners has a connection to Atlanta. You know, you never really know who has ties to what people in this industry until all of a sudden, you know, Matt Ishbia wants to bring Isaiah Thomas in and whatnot like that. Yeah, how, how's will, that going? Become how, clear. How, how's that going, by the way? Any, any updates not, over? He has okay. no formal role, and I, I do kind of buy that. But, um, but yeah, so yeah, I think Steve Clifford will probably be gone. I think Mitch Kupchak will probably be gone, and that's that's fine. I think PJ Washington to me is just a player who's better on a great team, better on a good team, a winning team. That was, even at Kentucky, like, he was not a go-get-a-basket guy. He was not, like, the focal point of their offense or their defense, but he was versatile. He played off of his teammates well. He could be a spot-up corner guy, or he could be an offensive rebounder, or he could, you know, face up, and he just, it was, that was always what made him special, and I think that's been what makes the Hornets a confusing drafting team over the years in general is they liked those college established guys outside of LaMelo. Almost all their draft picks have been that. And so 
you run into a problem if you're not able ever able to get out of that rebuilding phase then a lot of those players that you lean toward don't really get to make an impact because you never are a good team uh and so you know i think they're just kind of hitting a wall there a little bit but i mean even though the miles bridges stuff the nba botched it i think the hornets botched it if he's anything like what he was this team should be better than they were. I mean, I know we laugh at Charlotte for never getting out of this middle, but they were in the playoffs recently. So they should be fairly solid kind of poking at the play-in in the East, and you can't afford to lose good players. And I think, you know, maybe that gives a guy like PJ an opportunity to, to shine a little bit more. But, yeah, I mean, Boston could keep on the Grant thing. Boston got three seconds for him. So mm -hmm. if they did trade PJ Washington maybe a, a low first or several seconds and like a contract that's probably what you're looking at I don't know if they should have just taken that this year or wait till the trade deadline or next offseason I think that's an open question because the package you said from Cleveland as an example to me that doesn't actually sound terrible if you got Dean Wade and like a handful of second round picks okay like I might just do that if I'm Charlotte just because they're in such a weird spot yeah, this roster is just also full of other guys that I just feel like they should try to move on from in some way. Like, I, I would like to see Gordon Hayward, like, get to go somewhere else and maybe be, like, a 20-minute-a-game bench guy at this stage of his career, health provided. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I could... Is he on Brennan, the last year I mean, of his contract? I think he could be a buyout guy this year. Yeah, and buyout gets tricky because then you're, like, at a certain point, I think he is. I'm checking this right now on his basketball reference page... Uh, yeah, last year of his contract, he's making $31.5 million. Um, it gets tricky year. for what reason? Just, like, at a certain point, like, that's when you just, like, there, there's a thing with buyout guys. You hear people in the league talk about this, and he's at the age, though, where he maybe doesn't care, and he's made a ton of money. But, like, once you go the buyout route, you're just, like, never getting, like, a real contract offer again. And he might not get a real contract offer again anyway. So the perception that's maybe of it. it. Yeah. Yeah, it's like at a, at a certain point you don't. But he would be a bio guy for him would make sense if they could trade him. Like, honestly, Brendan, it's uncomfortable, but I could see someone at some point calling about Miles Bridges. Like, if he plays well and, like, there's not a lot of uproar, I could see a team doing yeah, that. Yeah, he honestly. has the, like, implied no trade clause right now yep. because he's on the qualifying offer. So it's a little tricky. And it, who's going to be the team that actually, like, <sighs> actively shows they want him? That would be... Even the Hornets weren't willing to be like super public about like, yeah, we want to pay him all this money. They kind of like took the easy road there. But yeah, I mean, what like this team to me, though, if if you're telling me that their kind of core five guys are LaMelo, Rogier, Bridges, Hayward, and then somebody between like Richards and Mark Williams and PJ Washington at the five, I know the Hayward health thing is a big question, but that's not a bad five-man unit if that's playing the bulk of your minutes on a nightly basis. Like, this isn't a terrible team. They just had no LaMelo for most of last year. Hayward was still inconsistent, and Miles Bridges was gone. So, I don't know. I think they could th turn a little bit around and feel – we could feel better about them by the end of the season. Yeah, the, the, the way I would put it is I think, I think they won't be unwatchable as they find their identity. Sure. I mean – I don't know about an identity until they get a new coach, but maybe. Yeah, but I mean, like, LaMelo's going to do cool stuff. Uh, yeah. Stability is maybe, like, I, I feel like stability will come with, like, a new coach and, like, maybe, like, a new front office person. But um, I, just I will hope say. they're willing to get more creative with everything with new ownership because I mean, they, they the have way to. Michael Jordan ran things, they were never going to win a championship. I mean, no. being cheap, being regressive, being old fashioned, it just, you, they were never going to be great. Yeah, you got to really go for it. I will say, uh, to end our Charlotte Hornets talk that to lead this episode, Brennan, very in on them bringing the, – the, did you see the classic jerseys they're bringing back for the season? Uh, I didn't. I will look them up as you tell me. So what they're the them. 35th anniversary. They're the double pinstripes from that they wore in the late 90s yeah. and early, early 2000s. I, I have just, wanted a Charlotte Hornets jersey because of the Jordan brand logo on them and just how cool they look. I like was very close to getting a Kemba jersey once upon a time, and now uh, I want a good Lamello one. jersey. So this this might have to be the one. I'm wondering who I would get if I had to buy a Hornets jersey on this team. Anybody but Lamelo is just a bad answer. 
Tell me one for, other player that you would want to appear in public rocking a jersey well, on this number show. Well, number one, I, this this would be like, can I put it in a in a shadow box and hang it in my wall? Well, whatever it is, have it appear in this wonderful podcast environment every time we record. You would want to have like a nice Rogier hang in there. Look, Shaker Heights. That's that's a Cleveland boy. Okay, great. He cut he. he, he the, the you bad want that to be your guy. guy. I'm not going to argue with you. The one and I, only I, Terry Rozier stand in in, uh, in the United <laughs> States of America, Chris Manning. Except for Terry, me and Terry Rozier, because that man definitely loves himself. True. Uh, All let's right, move on to Giannis, Giannis though. Yeah, so speaking Giannis. Speaking of jerseys. Speaking of jerseys, which you have behind you, which is cool. Giannis Antetokounmpo, who is not playing the Free World Cup, did gave a big interview to the Tal- uh, Talia Palmieri at the New York Times. Um, Tanya Ganguly. Sorry, yeah. I, why did I you mix her up with the girl at Puck who talks about yeah. politics? Yeah, I've been it's look okay. reading cover, reading some 2024 stuff this week. It's just my brain is ruined. Um, Giannis gives this big interview, and obviously asked about the extension. To his credit, he gave like a real answer. Like yeah. he didn't he didn't duck this answer, which I think is telling. To read the quote. Um, the real question is not going to be this year. Numbers-wise, it doesn't make sense. But next year, next summer, it would make more sense for both parties. Even then, I don't know. He added, well, let's I would talk not about be that the- first because these are kind of okay. different. These are a little okay. bit. One is the contract. One is like kind of the why and the context of the team right now. Sure. So, I guess just to explain, because I was uh, listening to a cat person break this down after it came out and. He has two years left on his contract, so he's eligible for an extension because he signed a really long contract, and it's been three years, but um, that was obviously the one he signed at the end of 2020 going into the year they ended up winning the title. So now, three years into it, he's eligible to sign an extension, but that would have to be like kind of what Anthony Davis did, where you, I think, terminate the last year really far ahead of time and then lock yourself in. Makes sense for a guy like Anthony Davis to get that max amount of money because of his injuries, and I think he's a little older than Giannis. Doesn't make so much sense for Giannis considering he's at the level where, like can like Kevin Durant or Kawhi Leonard or whatever, the contract's going to be there no matter what his health situation is. So there's no real need to like jump the gun on it. And the longer you wait, we know cap goes up. We know you know, you're further out with whatever that stability and security that a long-term contract gives you. So that was sort of more honest to me, Chris, than most people get, but also just kind of true. Like, I don't think he was talking out of the side of his mouth there. It's like, I think most reasonable people would agree there's no real reason for him to sign an extension this September, even if it's going to be like on everybody's Instagram feeds when they don't come to an agreement before the season doesn't really matter. That was a given, I think. Yeah, but I, I, I will say I give Giannis credit for just like saying that because I think other guys yeah. in, in, in air, I, and I think you're saying this, but I just to kind of further what you're saying, we're in an era where like superstars, I think, are more PR and media trained than ever, and they don't like say things that are just true because they're afraid of the backlash. Giannis himself has gone through this because I don't know if you remember – um, back when Malika Andrews was like covering the Bucks, they like lost yeah. some playoffs one year, and like immediately when they lost, it was like there was a leak from someone. It was who the just bubble year. Like, yeah. Okay. It was the bu- I, I, again time in my brain just just goop. Yeah. The article point. basically went up like as he's sitting at the podium doing his press conference. Yes. So he's been through like the backlash for some of this stuff in like the social media era. Yeah, I mean Giannis's the- contract three years ago was like the biggest story in the NBA for a year. So he's yes. he's probably dealt with it, maybe more than anybody outside of it's like, like you know LeBron obviously that, always, that, but other than that, yeah, it's like I think the last one that's had this sort of like air of intrigue on it is like probably LeBron. Like it's probably the closest because like there's never been a question that Steph was not going to resign. Like I don't think Durant's like for agencies had this amount of fervor about them, even though they probably should have, considering how damn good Kevin Durant is. Right, Probably, like I, I guess the year, the last year in Golden State, Durant's contract was a uh, yeah. major story. But also because Draymond then it was like, like we knew the Warriors were going to be fine probably without him, and then we yeah. wherever he went, okay, great. But you know, it wasn't yeah. the Bucks will just be back to ground zero if he leaves. Yeah. I think that's why it has so much yes you know, stakes. So I, I just give him credit for just like saying like the thing like he. 
He did the thing that a lot of players in any sport don't do anymore, which is say the, the part out loud that everyone knows is true, but it's uncomfortable to say. There's a lot of, like, there's a lot of I respect about Giannis handling it the way he's handling it. Yeah. By saying this in the New York Times, like, the biggest newspaper in the world, that this is, like, a pretty adult way of handling your business. And, like, I, I give, mm-hmm. like, that to me is cool that we still have a superstar that is carrying themselves like this. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. And I feel like there's maybe a little bit, I, I don't want to necessarily say it's going to be everybody because nothing is the same for everybody. I'm sure you could go back and find guys who have been open about their contracts, even during this era where we think of the secrecy of NBA superstars. But it feels like with Durant and some of the trade request stuff and now Giannis with this and, you know, even I think about Luca last year when the whole thing came out about the mural and then there was like the weird buzz around the extension and then the Kyrie thing happens and he kind of just nips it in the bud. It feels like NBA players might be remembering like we don't need to be scared about tweets, you know, like it might not feel good. And there are like hateful, bigoted, awful tweets from like random people. But as far as like what like Brian Windhorst puts on a podcast that gets aggregated by NBA Central, like you're a big enough brand and have a big enough megaphone yourself that that shouldn't be the reason that you like hide, you know? So I hope we're headed there. I I don't want to get like jump ahead of the, uh, ahead of it, but that was everything that Giannis has kind of done since that extension. I think he's kind of realizing like all that matters is what actually happens, not what gets talked about. And I think winning the title probably was a relief for him. But we can get to the next part of the quote. Yeah. Too. So the next part of the quote is, no, I think we just had a good discussion. I think that was worth spending the time on and splitting them up. That was calling your part. So the other part of the quote is, quote, I would not be the best version of myself if I don't know that everybody's on the same page. Everybody's going for a championship. Everybody's going to sacrifice time away from their family like I do. And if I don't feel that, I'm not signing. That in itself, Brendan, is another like pretty bold declarative statement. It's not surprising, I think, of how we understand Giannis. Like that, what and nothing Giannis said is really a surprise to me. It's just a reminder of like what's at stake here for him and and for the Bucks. Want to do a power ranking of who's not committed in Milwaukee? I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's There are some NBA podcasts you probably can go to where they will try to guess who Giannis is saying is not all in uh, for winning. But um, I, just to get the like funniness of this out of the way, the fact that a player whose brother has been on the team almost as long as he has for no real reason other than the fact that he's his brother, kind of a funny person to say, I spend time away from family. I know Giannis has more family than that. He has a wife, a, a son, yeah, parents, and there was, brothers and there who was, all live in Milwaukee, but it's just there, funny to there, say that. And there was stuff in the story about like him wanting to like quit basketball and being away from his family was like pulling him away that I found like, I, he is so like honest as like, and like open as a man in a way that is just like, honestly, incredibly admirable. There's also a lot of myth building. I sure, but like you know what, since he won I'm the a, title, uh, yeah. he has become very good about crafting yeah. the perception around him, and so there is a level of maturity to being willing to go on the record. It's the same thing we've seen with LeBron, right? Like we appreciate LeBron's kind of honesty and willingness to go out and talk about it about this stuff, but there's also the OBJ calling him out for lying, uh, you know, kind of like little lies and and those types of. Well, when yeah, when Things is uh, to build when, yourself up when you're that famous. When it, so when, it's when just is the two sides of it? Yeah, when is Giannis going to be like? Actually, I heard the Migos in like 2009. I'm like exactly. What? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I I knew Brooke Lopez could always shoot threes. I just <laughs> was waiting for it to happen. You know what I mean? Like whatever. But so uh, it's just a weird quote, especially coming off of the kind of like Bill Simmons and different people last year calling into question the vibes around this team and then they lose to Milwaukee the way that they or Miami the way that they did and it's a strange way to start the season to have something like this come out but maybe it was just this is about Bud or I don't know maybe it's just him kind of flushing last year down the toilet and 
he feels better. I mean, we don't know. This is not like the most in-depth discussion of everything he's feeling that we could have ever had. But to your point, it's more than we usually get. And it, it does it does intrigue me. And it just makes me feel a little worse about the fact that they ran it back because I already didn't love that. And to have some kind of like pointed comments about the people and then still have it be like, and they're all... Here they are, your opening night Milwaukee Bucks, the dudes Mil- that Giannis kind of just called out who shat the bed against Miami. Welcome back to the, what is it, the Pfizer Forum? Is that them? Yeah, it's the Pfizer Forum. Here you guys go. We're doing it again. We're, we're doing the same thing. Hopefully it goes better, like Adrian Griffin is our savior. I don't know. It's <laughs> just, I think there's already doubt about this team, and this just makes me feel a little more nervous. Yeah, and I and I think that's fair, and I think if you... Like and this might get into more of the myth building stuff. I think you're correct about, but like Giannis in the story is talking about titles pretty directly, and he's you know I he doesn't want to be like I think he's kind of obsessed with the title part of this a little bit. You know, did you read that um, as him saying he would take a pay cut, or that he would just want to leave? The pay the pay cut thing would be really reading really deep into it. Agreed. And NBA players don't really do that. No, nor and look honestly, nor except for they. like Dirk, I guess would be like maybe the one example in recent. So that that th- that is actually an interesting place that I want to go with this for a second because if there's anyone, if there, there's a couple guys in the league right now. I would say Giannis and Jokic and maybe Luca, but he might be like I don't think we fully understand like the Luca Dallas relationship in the way we do the Giannis Milwaukee one and the, and the Jokic Denver one, I would argue we, we don't have like the, the feel of like his attachment there to yeah. the same degree. Cause he's only been it's in the league a, like five years. Yeah. And it's just like, I think he's just like a, like he's young, like there's just, there's a lot of whatever. If there's anyone who's going to like take on like the Dirk, like stick around and be the face of a franchise in the way Kobe and Duncan did as well. And like, play 20 years in the league and just like be the one that keeps that franchise in that way at a very, very high level, like above what Dame has done in Portland as a, as a counter example, it's Giannis like that. It's him and Jokic are the two guys that I could just envision doing that easier than everybody else in this era of player movement. Um, well, so so that's interesting. Yeah. Agreed completely. And I think, um, that kind of the, the myth, the myth building, he was very proud of the fact that he won it in Milwaukee the year that they did. And Mm -hmm. I think winning and being dominant and and being great and thought of that way is important, but I think doing it in a way that separates him from others is also important. So I could, I could definitely see it. Um, I, I do feel though, like part of what's different about him than, you know, Duncan or Jokic or Steph or some of these guys who have been able to be the centerpiece of different iterations of their great teams is I'm not sure what the less athletic version of Giannis looks like. I'm not sure what could, could Giannis win a championship at age? What was Steph 34 when he won Mm -hmm. it in 2022? I don't know if Giannis can, can have a, bring uh you know rip the series back from the depths of a loss game four like Steph did in Boston at 34 because his game is so predicated on athleticism you do the contract no matter what but just thinking you know into the future of how they can reshape this team around him I think that's an open question and uh thinking of Dallas with Luka Dirk whatever I think it's always a fun game to play of like if you could build a a lab in a lab the best teammate co co-pilot co-star for x player is always a fun game just to think of what that player is and their strengths and weaknesses and i know the dallas thing has always been i don't even know if it ever had any real meat to it but for some reason Giannis and luca playing together with the mavs is just like one of those broken brain nba things that we've all seen from time to time but i kind of think it's the best fit especially with Kyrie. like i actually do think that Giannis is kind of like a screener defensive guy small ball anchor type of player with those two and maybe Kyrie less is less of a fundamental part of that team but yeah Ky- now 
Yeah, okay, just but yeah, banking on Kyrie is the fundamental part of anything at this point is is a mistake. It's about it'd be about I just Luka mean, like, and he about could Giannis. Leave. Not fundamental. Like they can win with Luca and Giannis and like role role players, but I just mean like I don't even know if Kyrie will be there. But I like sure. the idea of a scoring guard. So I actually do think Kyrie kind of with Giannis is something he's never really had. And then Luca just from the ability of them playing the two man game and you know, whatever. But what do you think? Like what kind of what other players in the league if if we're thinking less about market, because I'm not sure Giannis cares too much about that compared to, you know, other guys who have like, oh, that's home for me, or I grew up watching X team. Like, if it's just about players and winning, what do you think would make the most sense for him if it's not the Mavs? Luca would be an obvious one. Mm-hmm. I think Jalen Brunson would be another one. Like, I could just see that making a ton of sense. But, I mean, if they get Embiid, that would kind of change it because I don't know if Giannis and Embiid is, like, really allows you to maximize what Giannis is. And Giannis is better than Embiid, I think. Um, and? Sure. Like, yeah, I think I, I, it has... To me, it's like a, a scoring... Some sort of scoring guard who can take the offensive responsibility to create on every possession away from Giannis in a more so natural yeah. way than what Chris Middleton can do. Yeah, so I think Luka is like the apex answer to that question. And it's a guy that would like really elongate his window to probably win a championship because he's going to be 29. Like, Luka would I be mean, the... I mean, game would have been really fun once upon a time, you know, like... I mean, I thought about Jim, the, I thought the, the guns to do that now, but I, I mean, I I thought about him in like with Jimmy, but like they're, if they get Dame, like that's just a not in the question. But like, imagine him and Bam together. I don't even know what, like spacing wise what that would look like, but like defensively, just I mean, good like luck. if we're just like separating it completely from team and just playing like imaginary matchmaker, like Tyrese Halliburton and Giannis seems fun as hell. Just transition offense for days and. Halliburton with his kind put of him. creation and and put pull him. up shooting ability, like Giannis could just be a role man and a cutter and put, all that stuff. Put put him with like any of the really interesting young guards that are like fifth, sixth year and under. So like Halliburton, Fox, Garland, like I put him with any of those guys, and I think he's like pretty. Steady. You needed like, to be a shooter. That's the thing. Like I thought about Shea, but shea wants to live in that mid-range area yeah and so it's a little tight uh you kind of need shea to be there with the context he has in oklahoma city rather than like yana standing in the dunker spot and you know clogging things up a little bit so yeah it's a fun it's a fun thought experiment but i don't think he's leaving anytime soon it's just he's leaving it open so that means we have a uh, carte blanche to mess around and imagine it yeah and i and i the last thing i think we should say about this is i'm really curious just to see what we learn of this year with a new coach in there who I, I don't think we understand his principles the way we, let's say, did Mike Budenholzer's. What does Giannis want in a basketball sense? Like, are there stylistic things that change with the Bucks that are Giannis-driven, that he has feelings about, that he pushes for, that, that we learn about this year? Because I think we kind of understand a lot of his game at this point because we've just watched him so much and at these big points. But with a new coach in there, I think there's more opportunity here to see what his evolution is going to look like and if there's any changes that come to how the Bucks play with not that different personnel, but with the new coach that Giannis maybe is drives Is there anything that in comes there. to mind or are you just... No, I'm just spitballing. I mean, I really just want him to stop taking pull-up threes at this point. I don't think it helps anything for him to... like. Mm-hmm. Those are waste, those I feel think like that's wasted possessions. Thing. And I, I agree. And I, I kind of doubt yeah. Bud was like, dude, take him. Yeah. I think I, that I wa- is yeah. him. I tend to think you're correct. I don't know. I, to me, I guess one thing would be. Does he like, does he want to post up more as he gets older? Like, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. The older part is he's going to have to evolve. I think like as soon as this season, can he play more center? It might be good for Brooke too, honestly. Some lineups for them and things, but. Yeah, I, might be, and, yeah. I just think it's going to be hard for Adrian Griffin to change much, but obviously that's kind of conjecture at this point. That's Yeah, but also might be his job to like force some change. All right, let's go to the World Cup. Let's start with the French. The French are out, have lost to Latvia in their second match. They're losing by 30 to Canada. Uh, French going out with a real whimper here, Brendan. I, I got to say, mm-hmm. like considering their the, the players on their team, the reputation of that, this is a little bit surprising, even if, like, Kudos to Latvia for for all of this. This was a close game, but Latvia won the fourth quarter, twenty six to twelve. Latvia yeah. took over in the fourth after Canada had a real 
stretch of dominance in the second half against France as well. And Rudy Gobert, the co-favorites to win Group H, are out. They lost to a Latvia team that did not have Chris Porzingis. 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 So they didn't even have like the best player on the team. Just a tough way for Canada, to, or excuse me, for France to to get knocked out here. Shout, side note to start. Shout out to Chris Stapps for being there. Very cool that he's still like on mm-hmm. the bench and you know present and just signals that there is a level of disappointment that he can't be out there. And I mean, winning a game like this, you're like, damn, what if he had been? Because I mean, they they've been playing pretty well and he's a huge part of their team and would have made them even better. But yeah, on the France side, it's a it's a mess. I mean, I I, I actually this is probably one of the most uh, broken basketball sicko things that I've done in a while, but I watched the second halves of both the Slovenia game and the, uh, what was it? The third place game at the Olympics Mm -hmm. and last year's Eurobasket final to try to see like, what the hell is so different? Cause this has been a good team as recently as like, those are the past two summer international competitions and they were very good. Is it just that they broke down? Is it just, Canada, I think, is a unique matchup because that's a really young, kind of forceful, physical team. And and we thought they might struggle with them. But this Latvia stuff, I just felt like they had no juice. They were letting Latvia get to the basket and they weren't able to get to the basket themselves. And that might just be all it is. I mean, Evan Fournier and Nicholas Batum are older. Nando DiColo, their point guard, is like 30, mid-30s himself. They just, they were aging. That This was natural. But the other part of it that, came out after the game when Nicholas Batum gave a press conference, which we don't have to get into the geopolitics of this, but their point guard from Eurobasket, Thomas, I want to say it's Hurdle, but I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, um, was prevented from playing in this tournament by the French French Basketball Federation because he has made the choice to go to Russia during the conflict with Ukraine and participate in their domestic league in Russia as his like club team. And so because he made that choice and they wanted to signal their support for the Ukrainian side of all of that, we saw a lot of this stuff during the Olympics and obviously it's still playing out. Russia was removed from Eurobasket last year for this, so it's still touchy, understandably. He's not there and he's also fairly old, but he was very good for them last year. So it may be that, but either way, this marks the end of an era, I think, for for France and it's kind of crazy to say that because these guys have been mainstays. They've given the U.S. trouble. They're always around. They have a lot of NBA guys, and they're going to have to turn the page, and I'm not necessarily w- sure where they look outside of, obviously, the 7-3 dude who's about to take over the NBA. Yeah, uh, Batum had this quote, the part of this quote that I want to that I want to read that I, I thought was maybe the, the most interesting part of this. I have one year left in the France team. We need everyone in Paris, the best conditions, everyone. I don't give a damn about politics. We need the best team in France. I might give a damn about politics uh, if I were you, Nick. Um, I scored. I screwed up my last World Cup, and it really pisses me off. I I think him, I think, you know, I don't. I haven't seen any quotes from Gobert. Fournier had some pretty quotes about how the team got the ass kicked. Their ass kicked in the, in the first game. Yeah. Like, I think, like... This group now was going to be such a fascinating team to watch in France in in their home country for the Olympics. Yeah. Even if we don't think of them as favorites anymore, and I don't think we should in any way. I think just seeing them having this one last ride with these guys, I think with their backs on the wall at home, I think will be really fascinating for for next summer. That's going to be one yeah. of the two, three best storylines of the Olympics for from a basketball standpoint. Both of Batum and Fournier had had kind of made a lot about this last World Cup and last... I don't know if it'll be Fournier's last, but he was saying the whole, this will be my rejuvenation. I'm going to use this to re-kick my NBA career into like... Because he was pretty much benched by Tibbs all, all last season. Yeah. And I think he played fine, to be honest with you. Um, he had a nice teardrop in this game. Like, he had some stuff that was like, oh, okay. Like, he... He looked like Evan an, Fournier in international yeah. basketball. Like, you know, it was... I, I wouldn't blame this on him, but... I mean, Elia Kobo played awfully against Canada, just terrible, and then didn't play in this game. And they just did not have that initiator. But, I mean, the thing with Batum, uh, it, he's just not good enough to impact the outcomes of games anymore. Like, I uh, totally understand from a pride standpoint and a, and a national you know, connection standpoint the, the, the place that that Olympics next summer is going to hold for him. But 
I mean, he just announced he's going to retire after this season. Like, I mean, how mu- you can't say that guy is going to be the difference for you in a, in a lot of cases. And even then, his offensive game hasn't been really why he's in the NBA since like he was a trailblazer. So it's it's just not it's not going to be that. So we can talk about Canada in a second, but obviously, Wembenyama is the guy that I was referencing. We don't fully know what Embiid will do. I don't think those two guys can play together, so I think their decisions are going to go hand in hand with one another. And then you look beyond that, and you know, Kobo, Killian Hayes, those guys aren't going to be the future. I, I don't think they have Usman Jang, the Thunder dude. Uh, I think he could be something, but he's not going to be you know everything for them. And then they have this 2024 projected lottery pick who paid pretty well in the U19s. Uh, his name's Risa Shea, Zachary Risa Shea. Um, he seems like he's an interesting dude, very similar to the like Batum, Fournier, Mold, just like a wing who can do stuff. But I, if their problem was like penetration and offensive creation, I mean, is is twenty year old Victor Wembanyama doing that? Is you know projected lottery pick Zachary Risa Shea doing that? No, so. I don't know. It feels like next year's Olympics, I, I don't feel great about either for them. No, I would agree. Let's move on to Canada. Brennan SGA was the best player on the floor in their win over France, and it wasn't even close. They came out looking as good as I think you possibly could have hoped for them. I, I was a little skeptical of them. We talked about this in the preview, just what they were exactly going to be. Mm-hmm. But they dominated the third quarter. They outs- In the third alone, SGA had 13 of France's 25, or excuse me, Canada's 25. France wish they had SGA. They out France. Canada was out outscored France twenty five to eight in that quarter. Um, they really responded. I think like like little early France looked good. There's a second quarter moment where Gobert hits Olenek in the face, and then France responds gets gets run out on a tenth run by Canada. Canada had a big advantage as the re, as the on the boards and at the free throw and as the smaller team, like they were just tougher. This is sort a of legit- smaller. I actually think the size thing was one of my big takeaways. Is yeah, they they have Dwight Powell and Kelly Olynyk, so obviously Gobert should dominate that. But you know, uh, Rudy, it's Rudy Gobert, so we know yeah. how that can sometimes go. Yeah, Canada's but, like, but Canada's legit. Can, Canada is is here. To, I think make some real notes in this tournament. They're probably going to win this group, and they're going to be in a really good spot. Yeah, blue, here. Did, I don't remember who they played today, but they scored 130 points and dominated. So yeah, they're uh, they're cruising. Yeah, I mean, uh, so yeah, but on the size point, like I just think the France Canada matchup in general, but Canada as a roster specifically, very cool matchup to kind of highlight where we're going with size. I mean, the NBA shows it, but on the international stage, I guess you could say the international stage has kind of been there already, but. You just had like DiColo versus SGA, RJ versus Batum, Gobert. I mean, I said Zach Eady, who didn't really play in that game, but he's 7'3". You know, even like guys like Olenek and, and Yabusele are just big for their position and, and exert that as an advantage in the game. And I think Canada, uh, to, to pivot back to them, is that's going to be their advantage. They're athletic, they're physical, they may be undersized, but they have like a physicality and strength and sometimes size advantage at almost every position. That's It's just a cool team to watch, especially as they try to figure it out with no Jamal Murray because they pretty much have one ball handler on this team. One person who can like dribble, run a pick and roll, initiate the offense, whatever. And to me, the story of this game was Shea and the way that he adjusted his half-court approach from kind of the first to the second half. To your point about the scoring, I think he was a little frustrated. They were able to get Batum onto him in the first half a lot and then have Gobert kind of guarding the big man in the pick-and-roll, and And that's a lot of length to try to score over, even if we know Shea is is shifty and whatever, and he was trying to get to the floater and mid-range stuff, and it's like Batum contesting at 6'9 from behind and Gobert, you know, with the hand in his face in front, and then second half, he starts pushing, getting mismatches with Fournier and Okobo, punishing those guys. That gave him a rhythm. He was able to get to the the mid-range stuff and pull up twos a little more easily, and then they just really took over, turning defense into offense and everything. But they're going to be a tough out, I think, for sure. And I think some of the, like, they don't have the interior size. It's like, I mean, Dwight Powell and Kelly Olenek are NBA bigs. Like, it, it's not going to be like, oh, man, somebody's three inches taller than me. They've been in the league for 10 years each. Like, they're good. They're going to they're gonna understand how to mess with that, and I think do, out-dueling Gobert, like, proved that to me. Yeah, and it's not like we, we've talked about this, but there's no Jokic in this tournament. 
Like yeah. you, you like Jaron Jackson Jr. is not a size problem in that way. Like there's not a massive USA center or a prime like Gasol brothers tandem with Spain like waiting for you in this tournament. There just there just isn't with with who is here at this tournament. The, their win against Lebanon, Brendan, uh, one twenty eight to seventy three. Incredibly, Lou Dort gets the day off. Okay, salute. Just didn't play. Shea plays only had to play seventeen minutes of this game. Uh, Dwight Powell only had to play thirteen. RJ Barrett played twenty. He had still a team of seventeen points. Kelly Linick only had to play seventeen. Dylan Brooks played twenty. Like they didn't. They just this was like well rounded. They barely broke a sweat. Every player on their team had a positive plus minus. Several of them above 20 some above 30 like they this this is what you do against like a team like lebanon which no offense just like isn't up to the standard um like with Omari all due Spellman's respect to Omari spellman yeah spellman and, yeah like like that that's that's the guy well, on this so team. the size thing you mentioned spain and they obviously don't have like mark and pagasol anymore but they have they hernan gomez billy hernan gomez. gomez yeah and that 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 will be a matchup for France or for Canada in the next round, so that might be a test for them. But regardless, I think they've they've more than acquitted themselves and proven that they're kind of here to stay. And that not that doesn't just mean in this tournament. I think you know it means going forward. But you had a you, you want to talk up your guy Jordy, I think. Well, I just briefly on him because I, I want to get to Team USA and we'll cap out around an hour here. Uh, Jordy Fernandez is. Should be an NBA head coach at some point. Um, uh, Wendy had a story about him because Wendy's just the god out here doing the Lord's work covering this tournament. Um, hope he gets. Why to do just... more NBA reporters not try to get this assignment? I understand it's like crazy travel, but that's go it. watch that's... awesome basketball, get really good access, and see the world. Like it feels like it's always the same, like two or three dudes who travel with this stuff. And I'm like, are there can are there some freelance assignments? I'll take it. Sign me up. Yeah. Why would you not want to go? I don't get it. Uh, I think it's Americans get really intimidated by like overseas travel at times, particularly like in Asia. I think it can be intimidating. Uh, but I would say you work for ESPN, you're gonna they're gonna give you the resources to yeah, figure it exactly. out. Exactly. I think USA Basketball and ESPN between the two of those very very uh, well funded organizations, they're probably gonna hook you up where you need to go. But anyway, side note. Yeah. So he's Jordy Fernandez. Uh, he interviewed with Toronto, Milwaukee. Was a finalist for. Phoenix. He's yep. been around for a long time in the league. Now he coached the Canton Charge at one point. He was an assistant in Cleveland and in Denver. Uh, a lot of glowing coach quotes in this story from Mike Malone. Another one from Chris Finch. I think this is one of the next like really intriguing NBA coaches. I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I know for sure he's going to be great because I think that's almost impossible for first time misses and coaches when we don't get to interact with them every day. We're going off a lot of what people say and all that stuff but this is a 40 year old who has been around some of the best coaches in the league he's had head coaching yeah. experience he's getting this head coaching experience like this to me considering he's come from he's gonna have the denver rub he's gonna have the king's offensive rub because I, th- I think like he came to <laughs> he came to yeah, that was him sacramento he came to sacramento to be the offensive guy for mike brown like he deserves a lot of the, the credit there I mean, as we much know as mike, mike brown, brown is if if he had full control of the offense that team would not have been what it was i mean like we, we know enough about Mike Brown to say that. I don't think that's like some sort of disrespect. We should give Jordy Fernandez the credit for what that team did in a lot of ways. Yes. This is someone that is probably going to be an NBA coach next offseason. He's going to be very high up the list at the very least. Just pay attention to this name. He's 40 years old. He's a student of the world. He fits the mold of a lot of the, the basketball lifer kind of coaches we've seen come up in a lot of ways in recent years that have been around. Um, he's getting this experience now. I think he's, I, th- I would bet he's going to be given if I, you can ever say for sure, but just remember the name Jordan Fernandez. I think this is a good introduction to him. If you weren't familiar with his work already. Absolutely. I think to me, what's cool about it on top of everything you said, which it's crazy to have as much, uh, such a variety of he's experience 40. the way that he does and still just be 40. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. uh, on top of that, I think I'm, I'm looking at him and another coach together this season, and one of them already got the job, and that's Darko Rajakovic, because we're seeing like the globalization of of the NBA, but there's still a long way to go in terms of actual control and a- accomplishment and achievement by those people at the coaching and and executive ranks, and so I think 
Igor Kokoshkov, which I had a front row seat to here in Phoenix, being the first like European born well head coach, the, the, did not go well. There, there's a, I know he wasn't European born, but the other one I would throw in there as a disaster of bringing him over from Europe is David Blatt. Yeah, exactly. Which you had a front row seat to. So the track record I think has had stops and starts to it, and. So what Darko does with the Toronto Raptors as a player development dude, but also somebody who has a very, very extensive range of experience before getting that job. And now Jordy Fernandez, who's getting the kind of requisite head coaching stuff that owners, I think, like to have in their candidates. He should just be number one. Like if he doesn't get a job next summer, as long as the Kings don't completely fall apart, it would be a a mistake like I'll just say that a year ahead of time it feels like this that's where this should be going and that'll be a dude from Spain with a lot of international experience with a different perspective on things who I think could be a a, a number two so it's a cool trend and he seems like the right guy to kind of push it forward because he does have so much NBA experience I think that's key too I'm trying to think of like what I'm looking I'm I'm not I I don't want I don't like doing the thing where it's like who's gonna get fired <laughs> why it's not Washington and Charlotte, I think, are two. Charlotte's just Charlotte. Him coaching the Mellow to me feels like I w- I think that Give could it to be me. really good. That or like on or put him with Scoot and all those guys Portland, in Portland. Yeah. I kind yeah, of all, the, all three of those I, I think are much more to me about like the trajectory of those three teams than to yes. just like call out those coaches. But yes, yeah. but I I think my favorite if I had to pick would be Portland. Yeah, I. I, I hope it's, he's not on a team that, I mean, I hope this for every coach. Somebody always has to coach the really awful teams, but like, let Ime Odoka turn the rap the Rockets into something. You know what I mean? Let the let the like kind of more out there hires actually get stability. Like, I think Darko Rajakovic in Toronto is really good because it's like mm-hmm. that's a stable organization. They very seem they seem very committed to him. They went through an actual hiring process, whereas somebody like Kakashkov, it was like. Hey, fix this complete batshit organization for us. And he was built, you know, he was set up to fail. So you want to yeah. see these guys get a real shot. But uh, let's pivot the, to the, the, the The last thing is just there is like, uh, I think the opportunity thing, I think, is a great shot because I th- there's a thing with Blatt that I, th- I mean, Kakoshkov was around for a little bit, but he got kind of maybe like he, he came up pretty quickly. He actually right? was like a pretty extensive uh, yeah. NBA dude, uh, too. I think it just didn't, it just wasn't going to yeah. happen here. Blatt, before he ends up in Cleveland, was in talks to join Steve Kerr's staff in Gold State. And what I think that would have done for him in making yeah. the transition, it's one of the things that I think Fernandez being in the in America for like 15 years at this point and coaching at all these different levels, I think that is like, and it's the same thing with, with Darko, and I think it's, it's the same thing with a lot of the guys that we'll see coming up after this. I think that's an advantage to come. It's not like you're making the jump from coaching in Europe somewhere directly to the NBA where everything is exactly. a little bit different. You're, you're getting a chance to kind of integrate yourself in the different basketball culture and then descend to that top level. I mean, it'd be the same thing if like Mark Jackson was like, okay, fuck it. I'm not getting a job in the NBA. I'm going to go coach Real Madrid. All okay, those but Spanish I wa- fans would just be like, this dude doesn't know. It's, okay. it's just different cultures. It's different styles. It's different rules. It's different everything. Like you just have to have that experience. Okay, but I want Mark Jackson now to coach somewhere overseas and we get a documentary crew to follow him around for the season that he does it. No, he is about to get the biggest of big, big bags from Apple or Amazon when these new rights come up, and he's going to never coach again. So that, that, that or, just pencil that in. That or like the Saudi Basketball League, which we'll see if that sure. ever happens. It's one of those two things. Uh, Team USA. Brendan, they beat New Zealand. It was yeah. not particularly pretty. They looked out of sync. Uh, Windy, as he does during this time of the year, and he's the god, had really a really good story about this you can go read. Um what stood out to you? What what did and did not work for game one of the Team USA FIBA World Cup run? I would say I have I have like four big things, but we can maybe <laughs> start with the most uh, important one. I would okay. say for this tournament, the most important one is that their defense has been pretty overwhelming during yeah. stretches of including the exhibitions and then now this, this game, especially when Jaron and, and Mikhail are out there to just have like a really suffocating tandem to guard the pick and roll. Um, So I think that if you're looking ahead to what they can do this month, that that's the biggest thing I noticed. And I mean, these, these, I I know New Zealand's a pretty low level of competition. No, Steven Adams. 
Yeah, and and they're not really going to have a high level of competition this entire group, to be honest with you. But whenever they're really tested, I guess we'll see. But for the time being, I just don't know how you score against Jaron at the basket if in, unless you're like one of the absolute best players in the league. He he's so good defending the pick and roll, and you really see it when he's guarding like these, you know. What's the New Zealand league? Like the 20th best in the world? It, it's not even fair. Yeah. Here, I want to start with this, something that I think Wendy hit on that stuck out to me. It's just I I didn't think they looked super... It, this, took, this team took a little bit to acclimate in a really interesting way. Yeah. This is a team with a lot of guys going through this for the first time at this stage. Like I don't think of Anthony Edwards as someone who gets spooked by big moments. Mm-hmm. I think he was a little bit rattle in the beginning of this he talked about they windy in a story noted that their their warm-up was a little bit different everything wasn't exactly right um i i they felt just a li- it took them a little bit to get going here and it as much as you know like anthony ended up having a great game and all this stuff i thought halburn and reeves were kind of the game settlers coming off the bench in this game for team usa which i think bodes well for their depth i also think palo bancaro really just looked like he belongs skill wise physically and that boy whoo um, my hype yeah. level for a year two of Paolo is is rising based off this one game. Yeah, so I think you hit on all the other the three other things there. So, um, oh okay, cool. Look let's uh, yeah, let's hit the Halliburton part of this. Uh, I but also the start to me. Um, obviously, they weren't scoring great. I think you just assume that's going to get figured out, which it did, and. I think the panic of them being down early was a little overstated because yes. New Zealand just got hot from deep and like okay if if they hit twenty five threes in a game then you tip your hats and you know go back to the U S and lose your group but we Dar- that Dar- wasn't Dar- Dar- Mor- happen. Daryl Daryl Morey somewhere smiling at the math you know at the tall blacks doing his thing yeah, yeah. Uh, all black so yeah. I uh, yeah I, I I rewatching it I was like okay whatever that that really wasn't like the U S played really poorly it was just the sometimes they, they, basketball games yeah. start that way you know and they, and then, and again I think there is something to like these guys going through this for the first time like this is different this is yeah. a different energy this is a whole different part of the world this is not like and I would a imagine random... there were a lot more New Zealand fans in that building than American fans because that is a yeah. much shorter flight from New Zealand to the South South Asia than it is from here yeah. so it's not this isn't like playing like a Thursday night in like Detroit and like the crowds like kind of, like this is this is a whole different vibe it conveys on the TV it we don't you know we're not feeling a one to one, but this is a whole other world that you're stepping into. Mm-hmm. It's gonna rattle you a little bit. That's that's very human. That's very game. natural. Exactly. So, you exactly. Know, it's not like it's not like it's been two weeks and they've been there. So yeah. yeah. Uh, but as far as the Halliburton stuff, I think you know. To me, he showed what he's been showing in these exhibitions. I still think that there's a chance when push comes to shove that he plays over Brunson. You know, to he close should. a game. I think he should. There's some game where he plays more minutes. That's fine. Um, I guess the part that I want to go to from a rotation standpoint is are we headed toward this is the way I put it but I don't think it's a perfect one to one Paolo starting over Ingram by the next round. And I put it that way because I think Ingram's offensive decision making early in this game was a big part of why they started a little slow if you wanted to pick a nit and and why they did struggle early. His defensive effort was pretty poor, in my opinion, too. He he was the one who gave up a few of those threes. But then Paolo's actually playing backup center for this team. So I actually don't think he can just kind of slot in and start at the four. So I don't know. I'm, I'm curious, but the Ingram part does not seem great. And then he had this quote uh, about the discomfort that he's feeling. He said, it's totally different than what I'm used to. The team is winning, so I can't be selfish but it's a little frustrating and I'm just trying to figure out ways I can be effective. That was paraphrased. So that feels like you kind of can't ignore it. That is a starter who was brought in to play a different role, who is openly admitting after one game that that role is not natural and not comfortable to him. It's like, you know what happens in international basketball? If you, you don't play, there's plenty of other options. It's not, they're not going to change for Brandon Ingram. I think we know that. And I'm not trying to like be hard on him, but I think he's just being no, genuine but, and honest, which I appreciate. Yeah. But we know where this is headed. And it's not like running the offense through BI. <laughs> like that's not what this is. That's not what this is going to look like. And especially going into a season where the dude needs to play off of Zion Williamson a little better. 
it's just a, not a great indicator from the Pelican standpoint either. So I know that's a lot, but it was kind of like Paolo Ingram. How can we figure this out? A lot of that was swirling around my head. So I, I think Ingram probably continues to start for the backup center reason, unless they're really just going to decide, hey, we need to play Walker Kessler or Bobby Portis more. I think that's... Well, what about Cam Johnson I, over Ingram? He'd be the other guy you could start in that spot. And he the, the, he's a much more natural, go stand over there, put in effort on defense, and we don't have to worry about it. I th- I could see it, but here's the thing with Ingram. If I'm if I'm Steve Kerr and I'm Eric Spolster and I'm this like guys who've won lots of titles and Brandon Ingram, no offense, you haven't like won anything in your career, like you just mm-hmm. haven't. Brandon Ingram's path to being like the best version of himself is like it's not KD one to one because he's never going to be like what KD is, but he has to be someone that I think can be like bendable to his situation. Like mm-hmm. that's going to be the case with Zion. If he wants a future in Team USA, if he wants a shot at making the Olympic team next year, which isn't unreasonable, I don't think, in theory. Like that's I mean, kind of the role. I'm sure it's a goal. So yeah, no, not right. unreasonable so, at like, all. The, I don't know if it's going to happen, but I'm sure he wants the, it right. to. Yeah. The, the the start would make me think that you might see Paolo in Paris more than you might see Brandon Ingram in Paris. Mm-hmm. But he has to just like be that guy and make, like and it's I'm sorry, it's Steve Kerr. You're a wing playing for Steve Kerr. What did you think you were getting into playing? Like, mm-hmm. you're not playing for Popovich. You're not playing for Spolster, who like might just like run things a little bit differently. You're running Steve Kerr stuff. You're not running Ty Lue stuff. You're not running like your normal NBA team stuff, where like the wing who can shoot in and can handle a little bit gets a lot of the reps. Like you're playing for Steve Kerr. Yeah. This maybe and like I I'm sure that's also an adjustment, but I I would ex- for what I think of Ingram I. I would expect more from going forward. I, I think the bar for him should be as high as we're kind of outlining. I think he, he there there should be a demand of him to be more impactful than he was in this first game if he's going to continue to start and continue to be someone that matters for the team. I mean, telling, too, he played 15 minutes. Paolo played about 19. Cameron Johnson played you know 16. He, he played bless both those guys based on one game. That's not the whole thing, yeah. but it's not nothing. It's funny, though, because you said he's probably not – KD 2.0, and I think Ingram is too good. He's overqualified to... Ingram's a good enough player that him being the number one with good role players, you're not going to be terrible. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we've seen in the NBA the past few years is that he's been able to do that and has been effective enough at it that it's not been an issue. So his reputation has stayed afloat. But I don't think he's good enough that him being the number one on a great team is you're not going to go much of anywhere. So it's understandable, and the injuries in that team have made it so that he hasn't gotten to ever settle into something. And I, I'm like, I'm sympathetic to that. But this is an opportunity for him to do it. And to circle back to the KD part of it that you brought up, what's funny is we saw Durant actually <laughs> adjust to this exact offense and become a little bit of a different player. So... I actually think the Durant comparison is like what he should be thinking about. How do I fit in yes. to this type of scheme? I know what you're saying. Like he's not Oklahoma City Durant. He's not good enough to be the MVP and lead a team to the finals. But it's like, well, you know, a good basketball player who can do the right things in the context of and, the team should and help I mean, win. Yeah. That's what Steve Kerr's supposed to be able to do for guys. So, yeah, it, it's. It's going to be an interesting storyline. They don't need to panic and do it now, but um, if if Ingram wasn't starting by like the quarterfinals or even maybe a difficult group stage match next round, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, but yeah, Paolo is amazing. I think the number one thing Steve Kerr has done in this tournament is just realize that Paolo can play center, and it's not just offensively or size wise. The dude had three rim protection moments in like the first five minutes he played in this game. Like he's a legit has the instincts to actually play center. Like, who even would have thought? I know he did a, like a little at Duke being the biggest guy on the court, but it wasn't like this. No, I, I now want to see it in the NBA. Like, immediately, I was just like, I want to see Paolo, small ball five, Wendell Carter resting. Like, let me let me see it for a little bit at the NBA level. Because it's I know that's going to be different. I know there's a physicality difference at times. Mm-hmm. Hard to, you know, I can't see him doing it when you're playing, like, Embiid or, or whatever, but, like, I try it on try it against Bam when you play Miami. Like let him sink or swim in that kind of matchup. I think I'd want to see it. Sure. I mean they have uh, you know, the god Mo Wagner there as their backup five, brother of 
you know, the superstar. So we'll see how the politics of that go. But yeah, I mean, I, I do want to see it. I maybe uh, it's it's an interesting trick, but it is like, does it ever happen again in the international game when Bam is back on this team? And does it ever happen in the NBA with some of that stuff? But it's if I'm like Orlando's brain trust, I'm watching this. Like, how can how can you ignore it? You can't. It's a legitimate development in what he is and what he can be as a player um last thing on ant since yeah. you mentioned him he was forcing the fiba refs to call this like an nba game and i really just loved it like him in transition <laughs> there's basically nothing scarier than ant in transition i think maybe in basketball the way that he like lopes down the court with like a really slow dribble and you just never know when he's gonna shift into like fourth and get downhill and and plow, plow through you he had a few bad turnovers at the beginning, but uh, yeah, he uh, he was getting some BS calls that I feel like the FIBA refs were like, "Shit, he got us!" Like afterward, they like went out to dinner and they're like, "That fucking guy just he had us in his pocket." But I love it. Just Anthony Edwards, what a what a mensch. Um, any 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 final team USA? Any final FIBA thoughts based on what we've seen so far, Brendan? Uh, no, last thing would just be shout out that Franz, uh, Franz, Jesus, Franz Wagner um, didn't get too bad of an injury. He he missed the game that they played today. They barely beat Australia, although barely beating Australia without him is actually a really impressive performance. Yep. Uh, but more important than whatever Germany does is like Franz did not have anything too significant. It sounds like he'll be back uh, maybe even the next game. Let him, for sure, it sounds like the next round. So yeah, just you would not want that dude to get hurt with how much, you know, is kind of riding on this Orlando season and even for Germany, like he's kind of their next guy. So when I saw he went out, I was like, seriously, another one, but he's all right. Yeah. Uh, all aboard the Palo hype train. I'm there. That, that's great. That's great all month I'm... to be a magic fan. Uh -huh. You got those two guys just like doing their thing and looking awesome. And you just get to like salivate while you wait for training camp to start. That's great. Love it for them. Yeah, I would. I would be if I was like a magic like blogger, or like our, our friend Philip Rossman Reg from Lockdown Magic. I'd just be like, so Palo with the five. How can I milk like a week's worth of content out of this and just obsess? I'd be about doing it. two shows a day on this stuff. One for one Germany recap, one Team USA recap every single day. This is like their one, Super Bowl. The, the one in German. You do the German recap in German, right? Oh okay. yeah, sure. Yeah, he's a uh, Oppenheimer learning multiple languages depending on <laughs> what the audience might be. Steve Kerr is just like realizing the destruction of Palo with the five is just like the Oppenheimer like super cuts you see on Instagram now. It's like, uh, I do just I love done? the cockiness of Kerr doing that though. He's like, no, this dude's not at like a three or a four. He's he's a center. Are, I mean, it's you. and you'll be great at it right away because I'm Steve Kerr. That's the beauty of Steve Kerr though, because Steve Kerr is just like whatever, man. Like I'm gonna like do what I like my principles and what I believe. Damn, what like like it's what makes him and Steph such like a beautiful partnership is that like. Steph like just willingly fits into what he wants to do, but also like accentuates it. And like others, like can you imagine how weird it would be to watch like Steve Kerr coach like Kyrie, if like Kyrie was his point guard for like a decade. No. Or like well, and that's what's like, cool too about the. I know it's been like talked about a ton, but like this the little Spo Ant romance that's developing, which is uh, maybe terrifying <laughs> Minnesota Timberwolves fans a little exactly, bit. Yeah, but, bingo. There, that that's what's happened. That's that, that's more of what's happened. That's a horror movie that Pat Riley sure, is just going to like. The fact like, that clasp Spoke him coached, on the shoulder, Coach yeah. Wade, and now you know it's the same type of thing you're talking about, where it's like, yeah, beautiful baton passing. Um, but yeah, I hope to. I I feel better about Team USA. I think the past couple of games, you guys. I, I know you guys both picked them to win, and I was just kind of doing some content there. But I want. Uh, I, I might get I might get bought into it. I, I feel like we're headed there. I might I might actually really care by the end of this tournament and be really bummed if they lose. I don't have a little American flag, but until Norway gets it, which will never happen until I'm gonna wave my little Norwegian flag. It's Erling Holland. There you go. Look, do you, Brendan, do you know how much I will pay for a World Cup game in 2026 if I can see Norway somewhere in the United States of America? Well, my they have dad to make not, it first. Yeah, it might not happen. It's tough. It's tough. Didn't make the last one. Uh uh. It's not great. Uh, it's like I just Giannis need, like, on Greece a little bit. It feels like that to me. Look, my 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 niche to really like finding myself in like this in our business, Brendan, is like I need like the Lowry marketing of Norway to come through. Is what I need. I mean, you just you need them to get 
a reclassified American. I think that's your pathway for Norway. You need not like, but but better than Amari Spellman or Rondé Hollis Jefferson. Like you need. Yeah, I need. I need. I need like a fringe All NBA guy. You know. You need Brandon, Brandon Ingram. Ingram. There yeah, <laughs> Brandon Ingram to Norway, 2024 Olympics. Come get it. There we Let's go. Let's ride. I I will. I would. That would be. I don't, honestly don't I hope even he know. never hears this because I feel like when the Pelicans yeah. come to Phoenix, he will knock the shit out of me. But that's okay. I'd be like, oh, you're that Chris guy. You, and he'll be like, no, like I'm not the no, weirdo different who, person. Yeah. Even no, though this but, is on but, YouTube and it's very clearly our faces. Yeah, that's fine. Here's the thing, though. I have you know, this is the last thing we'll say, and then we'll get out of here because I'm like, we're crashing the plane in, into the ocean right now. At least I am. When I was in Norway, Brennan, I only saw one. I, I would like walk into like random stores because they would tell like soccer. You could find like second hand soccer jerseys and other jerseys and stuff. Decent amount of like random jerseys you would see. I saw one NBA jersey. The whole time I was there, and there's three of them in one store. Can you? Okay. Can, I'm gonna. I'm gonna give so you three of I'm the gonna, same person's jersey th- were in this store. Like it was in like some like yeah. random store in Oslo. Okay. I'll give you a hint. This guy played for. He's currently in the. He's a front office uh, of a team in the in the in the Eastern Conference. He's played for teams such as Philly, Utah, Cleveland, and Atlanta, and he has great hair. I don't have a guess. Kyle Korver. Ah. Kyle Korver, Utah okay. Jazz. Kyle Korver, Utah I mean, Jazz jersey. Racially makes sense, but <laughs> other than that, I don't fully understand why Kyle I, Korver. There's plenty of white dudes that they could have selected from. Plenty of more, rab- uh, European yeah. white dudes. Kyle Korver's yeah, just uh, an American man. Uh, I really, really lost missed opportunity. I mean, did not go pull that string to figure out where those jerseys came from. If I Should have bought it. That's a collector's edition, but it didn't have anything Norwegian about it, right? It was just like a no. Up also, NBA also, jersey. Do, do taxes in Norway when you buy stuff in Europe anywhere, but like Nordic countries specifically, mm-hmm. makes you Rough. rethink your purchases a little bit. Yeah. All right, we got to play the game that you mentioned next episode, oh, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Well, I let's just do that. Who's the best free agent left? Oh, oh, it's, oh. it's that's it. No, let's this do this next it. episode. Let's do this next okay. episode. All right, tease the. It's a good little palate cleanser with all the WNBA next episode. Yeah, well, palate cleanser because like the NBA stuff is we're it's free and he's done. I think we like to mix it up. We like to go back and forth. Yeah, yeah, and I guess we were going to talk about a center who I don't think is actually that good. It was probably going to be my answer, unfortunately. But next episode, WNBA final stretch stuff to talk about, plus the best NBA free agent still available that could maybe provide depth or help a team next season. Remember, please subscribe, rate, and review if you haven't already. Thanks again to Dylan Heiser for his work on production. Follow us on your social media platforms of choice, too, including Thread, including TikTok, including Instagram. Talk to you all soon. Enjoy the FIBA hoops.